Alana, I feel like you are um, slowly transitioning to like a reboot of Storm, but it's like one that we shouldn't do, which is just she's white. It's probably a bad idea. I don't feel uh, like that would go down very well. Muted. Oh, I'm muted. Why muted. muted? Oh, I'm muted. Storm muted. is a very uh, verbose a character. So. Oh, that's strange. Yeah, doesn't work. Did you hear that I thunder? Mean, no. I mean, you've still I you've got you've got, got, you've got yeah there you yeah, go. Yeah, you fixed it. Oh, you've got hey, Sue Storm, re- who's you know less offensive as a casting choice. That works. Well, yeah, I'd do that. Hmm. But would you want to play? Look, look, you you you've begun your career into. Look at me, I'm acting. Both you and fucking Greg Miller, get out of my <laughs> I, taking taking I have our very jobs. high standards. Troy, if you'd made it through the auditioning process, you'd be in the game. What can I say? Okay. <laughs> I was recording that. Please was, tell me that's gonna be recording. The episode. That's, that's it. <laughs> Fuck. I, uh, man, they they said standards. take chances, man. I was willing to take chances. <laughs> For the record, I wasn't invited to you the weren't invited. process. No. So you've got the bottom of the ladder here, mm-hmm. then the lowest rung represented in Troy, and then Success on the ladder, represented by Alana. Thank you. And Appreciate Greg that. Miller. Yeah, I, I aspire to be Greg one day. Um, where my acting career is concerned, I just hope that I can be Greg Miller. I feel like a lot of young voice actors are saying that these days. I'm seeing it all over the timeline. He's in Roger everything Clark, as well, isn't he? Right? He's in everything. How do I turn this off? How do I leave? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> He's Wait, in. Am uh, I hosting this thing? Lego games. He is, isn't? Yeah, he. Yeah. I was actually no. what I went to because when I before we worked together, one of the things God, I like to do. It. One of the things I like to do, Troy knows this because I've told him this. I, I go and I will man. watch a bunch of any actor who I know is cast to, so I can rewrite the script for their mm-hmm. specific kind of vocal shape. Right. And, and I did that with Greg and I was like, Greg, like, have you been have you been in anything? Is there any reference? like, Because like, otherwise I'm just going to go and watch a bunch of kind of funny, you know. And he was like, yeah, yeah. There was this, and he, was sent, he sent me the, like, the Lego games he was in. And yeah, yeah, he was in. Yeah, cool. Is he? Is he's he's the polka dot man, isn't he? In in DC or something? It's something like that. He was first a citizen in. Par- I know I should not know his IMDb. He was a citizen. Oh, in Paral- you've been looking like, at Greg's oh my IMDb. God, look at me. Oh. And then then this is what really gets me. This is what gets me about Greg Miller. This is beautiful. That guy has the audacity mm-hmm. by the sheer act of taking off his shirt. Yep. Creates a a comic book character. Yep. That then gets licensed to be in a game. It's good. It's it's diabolical. Yeah. If he wasn't such a just just a a, a hideous human being, <laughs> I he would, is awful. I, I would be he's proud. famously a terrible person. Yeah, mm-hmm. no, that's that's true. Nobody knows. Seventy two puppies he's drowned. Seventy two now. Seventy two. Going for yeah. a record. Well, well, seven. Yeah, as of yesterday. Hey, related. I saw Cruella. Before yesterday, it was actually five. So yesterday was just a massacre. <laughs> Huge day for Greg. <laughs> yeah. Oh, somewhere um, right now in the Bay Area, Greg Miller's going. Jesus he is seen. He doesn't listen. Surely we'll no, be fine. We he's can got too much to do. Like. Um, I saw too Cruella much to do. Uh, last week. What's that uh, like? I've not got around to seeing that yet. Dogs being what happened? Promoted. Did it just now get to Australia? What is what? What do you mean? She she's had some stuff. She has other on. she has some other uses yeah. of her time. Wait, when did I it suspect? come out? I guess a while ago, like like long enough for a to go. We should ago. probably forget it. A what was your ago. what's oh. your take? I haven't seen it yeah, by I the think way. But what's your take? Australia like a week ago. So oh really? Okay. Yeah, I definitely remember that there is a Disney related lag because of all my frustrated Australian friends getting spoiled on Mandalorian every week. Ah uh, yeah. What's oh, it like? Wait. Um, I, I was like just incredibly impressed by the soundtrack and like mm. set design, the fashion. Like it, it's a very both visually and auditory impressive film. Funnier than I expected. Sure. There are things that I was like, mm. but it was a good time. I had fun watching it. Good movie to watch with your dad, in case you're wondering. I recommend no sex that. scenes. No, that's the weirdest thing no ever. Sex scenes. Yeah, it's a bad time. That's why you're a sex voice. scene with your parents. You're just going. And like you're even old as enough, an adult, right? Even as an adult, no, it's weird. especially as an adult, you think especially there, as an there's, adult because now it's yeah, known that both of you, you know, have, have experienced that. Story. I'll never forget this in a drive-in. If you remember what a drive-in is, I was, I was, I was my they're sister back and I. In fashion. Yeah. They're yeah. F- thank you, COVID. Uh, my parents were like, "Hey, uh, we're gonna go see a movie called The Officer and the Gentleman." I was like, oh, okay. And me, being the very curious kid that I was, looked it up in the paper, which is where you used to look up movie information what, sorry, about sorry 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 paper newspaper I looked up it's a thing that it was an alternate use paper, sir. 
I did. In the paper. <laughs> the guy on the end of the street. Extra, extra. Yeah. Yes. Do and you so have I looked time in the papers. For the pictures? I just assume it's Newsies. Speaking of good stuff on Disney Plus, the Newsies uh, stage recording is on there. It's very good. I don't know. Um, so I am I'm, I'm doing something. I'm multitasking. I shouldn't, but I'm looking after you guys. Don't worry. Do you see Officer and Gentleman um, with your parents? Would you go see Officer and Gentleman? And in it's the like paper, calling off the hit. I guess is <laughs> what, that, what that means. Like, We're not talking I'm about Greg to anymore. Get Greg Miller. <laughs> Greg Miller just texted me. And he was like, "It's about to be 73," and I'm like, "Greg, for the love of humanity, please <laughs> just let the dog go, man." He went backwards. Well, at least so, he went back down yeah. to one. Yeah. He's gonna get like, a lot of very confusing wolf. tweets sent to him. <laughs> yeah. When this gets shown, please uh, comes listen. Out. No, don't do it, to Troy. Don't do it. Do not. Nobody who's listening, please do not <laughs> at Greg Miller yeah, at Game Over Greggy don't on do it. Twitter. Don't, don't do it, it and say, do it. Greg, do you love dogs? Question mark. Hashtag PWL. Please don't do that. That's <laughs> that's he, there, that's nothing that we want you to do. Do not no, at no. Greg Miller on Twitter at Game Over Greggy and this. ask him, no, Greg, neither. do you love None dogs? None of us endorse it, Mike. That's the point. We're saying we don't. Hashtag PWL. We don't endorse that. Hashtag we PWL. do not endorse that at all. So anyway, um, I look in the paper and under an officer and a gentleman, I see a letter. Here's a picture of, uh, who was it? Louis Gossett Jr. and and Richard Gere. Mm -hmm. And, and the, he's, he's in the, the Navy thing. And there was a big letter R. And I didn't know what that R necessarily stood for, but I knew what it represented. And it represented that was a naughty movie. And so I was very confused that my very Christian parents were going to see an R-rated movie. Mm. And here we were, my sister and I were in the, in the station wagon, and we're just watching this movie and not really tracking along with what's happening. There's a guy, he gets a tattoo. Wait, and then you he were allowed army. to go? Well, they didn't have babysitters. It was, just like, it was either, it was like, look, we could buy a tub of popcorn or we can watch the 13-year-old down the street with, with our kids. And they're like, ah, popcorn. Huh. So they did, they did that. And so there was this one scene in the movie where we're like, okay, kids, go lay down in the back of the station wagon. That's what we had to do. And of course, I was like, yeah, I told her we're going to listen to our parents. And then my sister and I both just do. Sure. And we saw boobies. Mm. And we both probably felt two different things at that time. But <laughs> maybe not. That's an okay thing because it was, it was weird. It was like, why did you guys watch this? And they said bad words and stuff. But when you're watching it, when you're like of the age where you're probably having sex and you're aware of what sex is and you watch a sex scene with, with, with your parent, a movie that has a sex scene with your parents and you both have the question in your head, but you're not going to ask, you're like, dude, do you do that? You, but you exactly. never, I have really never that thought question? that about never I've never parents. had that question. I have Neither. never in my oh, life. Oh, see, I relate, I relate to that for sure. Wow. With your dad, I, I, I can like, see that. Your dad would probably tell you before you asked. Like, no, no, oh, God, no, no, yeah, my, yeah. my, my, you're, you're so right, uh, Troy, about like, <laughs> I remember, I remember, um, just to put that in context, I, I, my <laughs> sister and I are both born early September, which is like pretty spot on nine months after like Christmas, New Year's. Um, and one day I asked my dad, you know, I find it suspicious that there, there's a, you know, two, two, two points don't make a good data set, but they are exactly like we're born two days and five years apart. We have almost the same birthday. So I said, like, I feel like there's something there. Uh, and he goes with you. I don't know, but I can tell you, I remember the thrust that made your sister. Ah. That was his response. And I remember to this day, killed me laughing. I was like, "See, this is what makes you different from most other dads." <laughs> I would. I, I don't think that I would. I don't think I. I don't think I'm gonna get that. Just like reflexively punched him through. Ah, oh, I'm, you know. I'm down. I'm <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. No, see that that. But, but why? Like you know, it's not like you get to live in denial that that is a fact, unless yeah. there's like a. But oh no. no, you do live in that denial. You, yeah, you're, no. There's you're like, there's an explicit and there's don't an Don't you remember implicit. the Simpsons with Grandpa going, I had sex! <laughs> you know, like, it's it's yeah. it's a fact of life. You've got to sell the TV rights to your dad. I think I've said that before, but you need to like, you need to write a, a book, a novel, uh, I don't know, oh my a God. comic. It does sound good. Just a coffee table book of just like things that your dad said with zero context. <laughs> I actually did start making a list at one point where I thought it could be fun to do like a rolling YouTube, uh, just like random reflections uh, of, you know, little kind of pearls of wisdom that I, that I, I, I picked up. Cause he was, you know, he was, as, as I'm demonstrating, he was all about the direct 
Like, I remember, I think I may have even told this story once where we were making a thing for our yard, like a kind of wooden sculpture type thing. It's technically a bridge, but it's just a decorative thing. And it's just a little thing he felt like building in the yard. And so, you know, I had all these little thin strips of wood and they required like a thousand little uh, drill holes to put screws through. And so, um, you know, he was really quickly just like, vroom, vroom, vroom. Well, at some point I was like, I, I don't remember what I said, but something made him go, I would not advise touching the, the drill bit uh, because we had just drilled like a thousand holes with it. And it was like, what would happen? And he goes, well, you know what? Okay, fine. Go ahead and touch it. Uh, and it's Dude. like, you know, touch it and it's five trillion degrees. And you're like, ah, shit. And he's like, well, now you know. <laughs> and it was like, that was pretty much all the lesson. And it's done. There's no like hard ass quality to that at all. It was like he, he was obviously not going to let me kill myself or, no, or severely injure bad. myself. Dude, I, I got to tell you, the the amount of trust, respect, and restraint that that shows within your dad is massive because there is just an inherent pull for for me to like keep traveler from harm even though it's like you got to bonk your head man you you got to do it right now and i've watched him just do stuff where he's right now he's at the point where he's like i'm gonna do this soft first it's like okay i got a good feeling on that but the fact that your dad like we just got back from yosemite and that entire i realized I have this view of of most places like, oh, it's an amusement park. You know, it's like, this is a, you pay an admission and you go inside. It is, it is the wilderness and it is there 100. Are bears like, oh, there. there are people stop there, like, there's bear right there. And I was like, as part of the ride, they're like, oh no, he'll probably kill you. I was like, ha, ah, it is it is a place, it's much like, you would feel at home a lot. It's, it's a, a guy place telling much you like that Australia. from within the jaws of yeah. a bear. I don't know, he's really pissed, he's trying to eat me right now. <laughs> it, is, it is a place that is actively trying to 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 harm you. And it's gorgeous and it's beautiful, but it is, it is the wilderness. And Traveler was incredible. We stood in a stream for an hour and, and skipped rocks. It was just like the most beautiful, serene, natural thing. But it was super hard for me not to just be all around him and just let him be exposed to elements that could potentially scrape his knee or whatever. So the fact that your dad would be like, you know what, man, I need you to touch that because that's going to imprint on you a lesson that is unilaterally transcendent and applicable to so many things in life. So please touch it. Well, and in oh, fairness, fuck. you know, my mom, my mom. Uh, he was a surgeon like, too, so that that he's like I could fix whatever you fuck up. That's true. He's like, yeah, I guess, yeah. And that's, he didn't that's care a about you, so I feel like yeah, that. Is that. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, that, there was a very healthy tension there, I think, because my mom was generally the one who was like, "Are you watching? Is he safe?" Or, or and 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 so I it, it never felt like there was no safety net. My mom was very much the voice of like you. I want to make sure that you don't die right now. And my dad would be the, he's fine. And like, sometimes she was right. Sometimes he was right. Oh, he's actually uh, hurt. Yeah. Like, he's oh, sleeping. Crap. Okay, yeah. He's unconscious. <laughs> yeah. He's been sleeping for a week. Can I ask each of you a uh, question on this video game podcast player watch list? And hi, I'm Alana Pierce. That's Corey <gasps> Baker. That's Mike Bethel. It's the show over. And that's Austin Winter. Yeah. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Um, what's your everybody dumbest injury? Mm. I got a good one. <clears throat> okay, you go first. It's, it's very on topic for this subject because my when I was growing up, actually, I love this. So inspired directly by the genius of Tim Schafer's Full Throttle, the only game that my dad and I ever played together. He went and bought a Harley Davidson. Wow. Um, <laughs> and he had he had ridden motorcycles as a kid, like because they're obviously cheaper than cars. And at some point it was like, you know, this is my preferred method to get around. Um, but then he had not ridden a bike in ages and just decided, you know what, I want I want like a pleasure cruiser. So I was probably, you know, 13 or something. And he said, you want to just go ride around? You know, it's like Saturday afternoon. And the reason he had bought this particular one, the Heritage Softail Classic, was because in full throttle, you know, Ben's bike has like a thousand tailpipes that are all crazy. And it kind of looks like the Iron Throne, you know. And... Um, and so the Heritage Softail Classic had a few very showy tailpipes, kind of the closest that you could get. And it's a very loud, very typical Harley Davidson obnoxious motor that's just like. There's one word un going through my head right now, and you know exactly what it is. It's it's a. Uh, I got a few guesses. Uh, oh well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> of course, yeah, duh. That should have been the first. Um, but yes, yeah, and it's so accurate, like. Um, 
Although, as my dad pointed out, that's a safety feature of motorcycles because you can hear you're really hard to, you're really hard to see. Yeah. Uh, you're a small target, and it makes it impossible to miss. Yeah. A lot harder to sideswipe. Interesting. Um, they are nonetheless very annoying. Give uh, them a horn. So, Give them a horn. You don't want to lay on the horn all the time, though. Constantly. Um, but uh, so, point being, I guess it's effectively the same. So uh, the um, the first thing he said, we get a ride on the bike, and he's like. This tailpipe, when we get off, we're going to ride for like an hour. When we get off, this tailpipe is going to be like 5 million degrees. Grab it. No, sorry. So, yeah, it was <laughs> like, don't, don't don't be stupid, you know? Um, and we went and rode to an old friend in a part of town we had used to live in. And 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 I remember pull up on the bike and they come out and everyone, you know, wants to check it out. or So I'm standing there next to it and I'm just kind of like rocking in place. And I felt myself roll on my heel up against and felt the like... And I was so freaked out that I was disobeying his one very clear thing that I just kind of bit my lip and slowly pivoted off and didn't say anything. And then when when we, you know, everybody 20 minutes later, like part of company, I like snuck away with my friend. I was like, do you have ice or something? Because I really think I just severely damaged my leg. And hey, it was Dad, like, on our way home, can we maybe get some ice cream and go buy, I don't know, a first care unit? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, I, 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 I and, and I did, I, I feel like you probably shouldn't do this because I just thought, well, maybe I can reverse it. So I like grab a bunch of ice cubes and start rubbing it on the skin. So it's like, I'm traumatizing it the opposite direction yeah. now relative. So anyway, we, we finally, we finally get home and it's like starting to look really bad. And it's like, what happened here? And I just like broke down. And I was like, I did the one thing you told me not to do, and I basically had too much pride uh, in making the mistake. And he was like, "That's the point of that is that you're okay. Like, it's not a rule. You didn't. You're not upsetting me. It's not like I made this rule. He, he felt bad that I was ashamed to admit it. Mm. But it, the whole rest of that, it, it fully blossomed into a full-on second-degree burn, and it was the most ugly thing. And I, I still have a scar that's like the shape of an eye. Really, it's very, very, very faint now. But oh. for Years and years, it was like, especially if I got any kind of sun, there was just this really awkward looking, kinda like. I kind of got to show it now. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you can't see it anymore. Oh. Uh, you just we'll said be, it was we'll still faintly visible. You just yeah, said yeah, it was, yeah, yeah. You could, uh, well, it's still it's, visible to this day. It's not visual medium also. It is. Yeah. Now, I, as it, much it, as it, I would it, love to show off my, it my ended up being, <laughs> it's about to right. get that money I know. my balls on the tailpipe. So yeah, I've I've injured myself in really stupid ways a handful of times, but that was one where I was very ashamed of what I had done, yeah. uh, and then I, I think I actively made it much worse. I my, my oddly enough is kind of similar, but far less. I my sister had a curling iron, and I was like, I wonder if this is still on. And instead of just feeling if it was hot, I put it to the side of my face. I went, <laughs> Psss, and it scarred, and it was just like right there. It's not a great idea. That may be the dumbest. Yeah. I mean, I've I've had a lot of of like, I I tried to jump onto a stage. This was recently. We were in Philadelphia and we were doing a live show. And I I was out in the crowd and I was running back up on the stage. I was like, I can do this. I'm not 45 and bunk. And I did it and I missed and my shin hit the corner of the stage. And I was like, Good night, everybody. And walked <laughs> off stage and I was like. Oh, it was bad. I should have gotten stitches and I didn't. Mm. And it's I still have a scar. I can probably show you. Sure you do. Hold on. Can I show you? Troy it's a choice to make a podcast. Yeah. 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 Fuck, I don't know. Austin's got all these other podcasts he does. I'm all talk. He's got committed. Ah. There it is. Oh. There it is. I actually can see it. All right. <laughs> Very good. Very I can't good. Van Damme like I used I liked to. How, uh, I liked how gym, gymnast that looked. You it were did. very... Pointed toes That, that looked very natural. Yeah. <laughs> I I total done. nimble. Someone's gonna put that on Google. I'm sorry about that, Troy. Yeah, <laughs> shit. Yeah. You're on. I you're on can dare you. feet or whatever. Yeah. Mm. Uh, how about you, Mike? You. What's your dumbest injury? Yes. We have a topic. Dumbest injuries. <laughs> I got two. I got two. I think probably. So the one, the one you all know about is I broke my foot in <gasps> Captain yes. America's fantasy place. Yes. Because it's the it's the location they shoot like the dance hall scenes in those movies. And this was I, recent. This was very recent. Yeah, this was. We were doing. I was doing. Uh, I was doing an interview for the BBC in there. Like, and they chose it because it was this cool backdrop. But it was like this quite dilapidated old dance hall that was just used basically as background for TV shows and movies. What do you um, call the thing that they put you in? 
the thing the thing you the, saw me in i don't know what is what is that called like a, a brace to boot it's like a big boot yeah you broke but in. is that not weird and being in the uk because why would you call that a trunk solid continue your story i apologize it, it, it did mean i couldn't play soccer for a bit so you know it was, it was devastating hard. Um, <laughs> I liked I liked the just quiet admiration of your response to that mic. Yeah, like solid. Well, that's right. one I've read of that's one read of my expression. Yeah, one read, one possible read. Um, the but yeah, the other one I guess was uh, yeah, big sp- really bad sporting injury I got as a kid, broken arm. But it was doing the sack race, which is the least mm. impressive sport. Did the sack race make it, it to America? Do you of course have- it did. You do. Okay. Yeah, okay. Sack races, yeah, we we call it potato sack race because potato it's a sack race. Brand. Nah. So you yes. definitely had that. So that was, um, yeah, not super interesting. I'm not a very good storyteller. I don't know if it's coming across. Like, yeah, uh, you're notoriously awful at telling stories. Nah, That's nah. what they say about my Award-winning people. storyteller can't tell a fucking story. Yeah, sorry. Wow. My dumbest is uh, I cut my hand open with a hacksaw trying to cut through a Kirby amiibo. Um, I do That's still have the scar on my hand. She's one. Do you, see it. do you right still there. have the Kirby amiibo? No, that is. Uh, what was the what was the bit that was for? Was that for like a video or something? It was for a feature for IGN. Yeah. So when I was waiting for them to finish my visa paperwork, which took forever, I was stuck in limbo. It was like a mm. well, we don't know when you'll have it, but don't go anywhere. You can't do anything or work anywhere else. Like it was very months of not being able to do anything while I was waiting. And so, because I was like, well, because I can't really move on with my life and this has taken six months, I think it took. I was like, can I just, wow. can you start, can I start writing features so that I can get paid? And- uh, Wait a minute, wait a minute. They were doing all this with no money? Well, I, you don't get paid while you're waiting for the visa, no. So, uh, no. It's a big uh, process, uh, yeah. yeah. It, it takes it. a very yeah. long time. I got the job Oof. in, May and started in November. Um, it, yeah, it took a long time. But uh, yeah, they, they were like, well, let's, let's give you a bunch of features so you have stuff to work on. And they are all things that I could do remotely and that didn't have to be uh, evergreen or did have to be evergreen rather. It didn't have to be timely so I could do whatever. And they were like, I don't know, cut them an Amiibo in half. It was around that time, I guess. So that's what I did. And it was uh, really hard. parts of your hand. It, yes, it was very difficult. Like but I was like, I'll slice through that. the Amiibo. Like, whatever. Why? That it would have gotten views. For science. People would, because people would be like, huh, why did you do that? Or what does it look like on the inside? Is it is it like a tree? I mean, are there rings? It's like, think of it like I an unboxing video. Empty, but pretty you know? thick. It, I'm just saying, it's going like, no to the, ever it, inside. It leads to the natural conclusion of like the unboxing of a human cadaver. And then you're going to have to upgrade to live subjects from there. And it's just, and that's you what know, I've been doing down the since. rabbit hole. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, it was really like, hard to cut Miller. open, and so I had I had changed through multiple tools and ended up with a with a hacksaw. I was trying to cut through it and just sliced my hand. It bled a lot. It was not not a good time. Pretty stupid injury. Do you, do you need stitches? I don't think I went to the doctor for it. Also, you smart. know what? I did. I and I had to get a tetanus shot, but I was like several days late because I was like, "Wow, this hurts a fair bit, huh?" Because it continued to hurt really bad. So, yeah, they made me get yeah, a tetanus shot. When it's like bright red out. and hot to the touch, these are not good signs. It's pretty bad, yeah. That would be my dumbest one. But also when I was, a, uh, I think I was one, my mom had put on a bath for me and then got a phone call. And I decided to step into the bath, even though it was exclusively hot water, um, and burn my feet and had to go to the hospital. But my feet are completely fine. She was, like, confident that she had destroyed my feet and was a terrible parent and, you know, was going to parent jail. Uh, but... I don't have any recollection of it even happening. And they were How like, old were you? One, I think. Ah. It's pretty young. Yeah. Young enough that I could get in a bath, but not young enough that, no, not old enough that I remember anything happening. You, you become a new person from an epidermal standpoint every 30 days. That's crazy to me. But I think on an atomic level, you replace every atom in your body. I think I'm it's not atoms yeah. as eight, much it's as eight it's years for the whole skin body. Cells. I think he's talking. You're talking skin, right? Yeah. I'm talking skin. Yeah, I think it's skin is eight years. Sorry, sorry. Skin is as you said, thirty days. Uh, full body is eight years. That that right there mm. is. First of all, I feel like we all just got high. <laughs> but, ship of Theseus. That is the it's, feeling that tends to set in exactly this moment right? in every episode of the podcast. Just, in fairness, like what? it definitely has that kind of. 
24 minute mark. in a garden vibe <laughs> around yeah, man. <laughs> like it's like what makes you you that is the most fascinating mm. concept right well you are just this you don't why... exist you're a concept that your brain has decided to believe like there's no is that is that that's that's like a derivative of solipsism right it, to, where, to where it's like i only exist because i think that i exist I mean, it's biological Kant. truth, right? The sense of self is is a construct invented by our brains. There is also, no... I think, but out of necessity, though. Like right, exactly. It. Yeah, no, for sure. For sure. Solipsism is is different, just for the record. Solipsism Please. is the fact that you can't... It's it's difficult to basically you think that's prove you are, conclusively right? that you are not the only thing in existence. Like, I, I can't... I can't truly prove that you know, this is not all a uh, matrix style illusion and that you guys are all Some days it has the ring of truth, doesn't it? Yeah. Some days. I, I just, like the, we the, need the, to the go problem. back to that wardrobe because I had a lot of leather in the early 2000s and I still want to wear it. You can, Troy. You can make that happen. <laughs> They're making happen. a new one. They're making make a new one. Now you're out in the farms. It'll go down great. Yeah. yeah. It'll be great. Hi, Troy. <laughs> Pears are coming in nice. Yeah. <laughs> I uh, I I always found it interesting how police will say on your person. Every time mm. I hear the phrase on your person, I feel like I have an existential crisis because <laughs> I you, have a person. That would be the perfect response. So, uh, Miss Pierce, do you have uh, any drugs on your person? Well, let's talk about what on your person <laughs> Define means. Define that. Man. Yeah. On my person, what does that mean? <laughs> like, what and am if I? I do, if the two I hours did later, have drugs, the two of you are like sitting on the side of the road and just like, crying. Just yeah. got both would you like, now like some? And we're both high. Yeah, it always gets me. Yeah, it helps you deal. I just don't understand what the question even means anymore. <laughs> I uh, total total about face, but I mm. on the subject since you mentioned seeing Cru- Cruella, which I wasn't particularly. Oh fuck! Crazy I forgot about, about that. I wasn't crazy about it either, but I thought it was fun. Um, it's just a funny thing that it was like I, I think it was the the uh, pitch meetings uh, screen rant oh, video where they were uh, like yeah. where they were like um, you know we're making a character origin story that has to somehow be a protagonist but yet like theoretically is leading towards a character that wants to skin animals for their to make coats that like like how how are we making a protagonist oh we'll just Paging put them next Blake to someone Snyder. that's much more <laughs> evil you know like. Let's just make Emma Thompson just that much worse, and we'll forget about the path that Cruella Wait. is supposed to mm-hmm. be on. Is it Thompson? Okay, this is where I get confused. There's too many Emmas. Emma Stone. There's Emma Thompson. Thompson. Emma Stone. Emma Stone. Yeah. See? Emma Thompson was the one who isn't was Emma Thompson lifelong... also in Cruella? Isn't Emma Thompson the bad guy? She's like, the baddie in Emma... Cruella, isn't she, she Emma Thompson? Yeah. Wait a minute. Unless yeah, I'm getting right, my yeah. British actors confused. Like the, 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 Kenneth, the, the frequent collaborator of... I'm not... I, first of all, I will not be corrected on female actors by Austin Wintry who believes that everybody is... Who is it? Is it Jodie <laughs> Foster? All blondes look the same or whatever. <laughs> yeah. it, it is Emma Thompson, yeah. Naomi Watts is in Cruella de Vil. Wait. I thought that was true. Emma, that sounds right. There's Emma Thomas and Emma Thompson, correct? It's Emma Thompson. Emma Thompson. And Emma Thompson, Thompson is, is the British about. actor that was like lifelong friends with um, the dearly departed uh, uh, Alan Rickman, correct? Not yet. Not I, mean, I have theme, no idea. Like, yeah, Emma Thompson is the Kenneth Branagh. She's in like all of his stuff. And she's, all, by the she way, all married the British. British. All the, was she married to Kenneth Branagh? Huh. When they Are did, they married? Well, they were married what? when they did what, uh, uh, Dead Again, which is a fan, it's, it's one of the first things he directed. And it's brilliant. It's his great Hitchcockian goes back and forth. He's between. a severely underappreciated director. Uh, like, agreed. I I think he is an absolutely a correctly really... appraised doer of a Russian accent, though. It is. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It's it's like it's, not gifted, it's like one step area. above John Malkovich, right? It's 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 pretty. Got, bad. What's his name? What's his name? Stepping up this week, Ray Winston, doing Bob Hoskins from Enemy of the at the Gates. Oh yeah, um, I love that movie. It's, it's great, movie. but like the Bob, you know the Bob Hoskins accent that he does in that. Do you remember the Bob Hoskins Russian accent? No. Ray Winston one hundred percent is doing the Bob Hoskins accent in um, Black I, Widow. Enemy at the Gates. It, I think Kenneth Branagh was good in what was the uh, uh, the new Jack Ryan movie with uh, Chris Pine? Right, he was. Mm. Um, I think it was called Jack. He Ryan, directed right? that. That checks out. Jack Reacher. <laughs> Jack. One Ryan of them's Tom Cruise. I don't know. <laughs> Jack Reacher was Tom Cruise, but yeah. Well, anyway, I'm gonna grab this one and pull Cruel it back Evil. where I was do it, going. Do it, do it, do it. Um, so um, normally the, the one who's responsible for derailing everything, but people can grow. I have an arc on this no, show. No, you don't. Um, 
Well, I, just because I can backpedal, I show glimmers of a potential. No, you're life. not changing. Um, <laughs> that reminds me. No. So, um, I um, I have not seen the Tomorrow War, and I don't know that I feel particularly you're motivated. To you're see better it. off. Yeah. yeah, but something I I have a friend who's a screenwriter. And and he watch he's one of these people that sees every movie ever made and, and so everyone he has kind of like a following of friends on Facebook that are always curious his reviews because he, he you know, he can be pretty thorough and thoughtful in his reviews. Um and he has made comments like this in the past and I always feel the need to sp- jump in and speak kind of collectively on behalf of our industry. Because one of his critiques of that film mm. was the writing felt like a video game. That was his, one of his comments. Oh, and what that he meant does was, such a disservice to video game writing. Mm. For sure. But, well, I would say thank you. But here's, well, here's what he they meant. They wish it was that well written. What he meant was the drama, it never felt motivated by character. It was a succession of side quests. That's exactly what he meant. He goes, mm. this movie felt like we have to go here and do a thing and chase a MacGuffin. And now we're going to go do another thing and now do another thing and now do another thing. Questy. And then like, look, we reached the end. And and in his mind, that this like kind of parade through a succession of side quests has a, a video game quality. And as I thought about it, I thought, OK, well, let me my knee jerk reaction is to do the same thing you guys just did. You say, like, oh, how sure. dare you? Like, definitely. But then I thought, well, you know. How many video games are truly, like, obviously games like, you know, God of War, The Last of Us, Thomas was <laughs> <Wilson, laughs> represent. I was going to say, uh, that was the moment. The Last of Us Part 2 make, is make not sure that. You're going to your friends right now. <laughs> No, that, but actually, funny enough, I all three of those are unironically invoked. Like that, there are games that are brilliantly written, no matter what you stack them up against. But I don't think it's unfair to say that most games, I think, as I thought about it more, take issue with most. I don't understand many, the criticism. Surely, I, I mean, they, character they, character is revealed rely, through action. I don't really they understand. Rely, well, exactly. That's what I was going to say. They rely on the agency of the player, knowing that the investment comes through doing. Um, okay. That's all and, action like, there, cinema. That's 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 everything that that's but there all are so many driven through action. There are so many games that I've played where I was like, oh my god, it's amazing, and I love the writing. And then I go back and I like like I'll sit with like a screenwriter friend and watch portions of it, and they are so cold to it. And I realize it's because they didn't do it. They didn't oh. feel what it's like to do it. And I thought, is that does that mean that? So here's one of two possibilities. Mm. I'm curious your thoughts. Number one, does that mean we give? a pass to weak writing because of our agency or does it mean that it's not weak writing it's writing that is in it is it is it is taking use it is for taking advantage of the medium for which it's written i think novelists I don't know the often answer. hate very... movies i, I think you, I have... if, if you don't know if you're not mm. in the medium and it sounds it's a dismissive tone i'm taking maybe but i feel like a dismissive tone was initially taken by the other party like Oh, for sure, it's, and I don't, I don't, I don't like, defend that or condone that. Oh, of course, for the I, understand, I, I understand. think he, and I'm I sure he doesn't clearly... mean it in that way either. Like, it's, no, he it's, does. Oh, he's he just does. Not a... <laughs> <laughs> he's just, he's just a, he's he's of that he's of that type that thinks games are for kids and movies are for oh, no. adults. You know, like and that and he's like every previous, which is obviously of... ridiculous. Yeah, but it's but it is something. It's a it's a system that repeats. Like it's 100. percent You can go back to like. When television was starting, you can find all the radio writers who were saying the television massively ruined the power of the spoken word. And then you can go back right. to movies and television. You can, you can, at every single turn of the, there were people in the cave doing the cave paintings who didn't like these upstarts trying to make sculptures outside. You know what I mean? Like there has always <laughs> yeah. been, it's, it's, it's true to, the, it's true to medium. You don't, if you look, if you want real examples of like when, writing in games has really been bad it's often when they hire movie screenwriters because as you say it's a Reach. completely different skill set it's a completely different mode of telling stories um and yeah i i, I guess i really do i do have an issue when i see like for me i i, did, I literally used to do a 20 minute talk at conferences of um why die hard is the best video game script ever written the die hard action movies in general but die hard in particular is such a brilliant narrative built around action beats and around action revealing mm. character. You're Literally, saying the film script is the best video game script. I'm saying that you can learn a lot. Of, I mean, that was the name of it because it was, it was a, a pitchy kind of thing, but like the, the meaning is there's, like, there's lessons in it. So like you look at Die Hard, 
literally the entire character arc of the protagonist is he starts by being told by a yuppie how to uh, fly properly, and then he ends by making a yuppie literally fly out of a window. Like, it's all action. There is no... Hmm. The writing is unpretentious and straightforward and, and just kind of moves the plot along in a lot of cases, minus a couple of cool catchphrases. But the structure... And the way action is scripted to tell story, to tell character in Die Hard is genuinely incredible. There's waypoints. Would... There's they use a nude calendar on a wall to teach you the layout of Nakatomi Plaza. You understand when you're watching that movie, you know where everything is because they walk past it and the camera like lets you know literally there's like a it's like a nude poster in a, on a wall, and they use that several times to kind of tell you where you are. The calendar. So much good stuff in that movie and so I many would, good I would lessons. Put, uh... That's a great. That's a great point, and I would put Jurassic Park in the same category. It's basically famously one as well that breaks every screenwriting rule that Hollywood tends to stick to in terms of like its pacing and its act structure. Jurassic Park, you have to work very hard to fit that into the kind of save the cat style three act structure. Like it's a really and it's also very little people's movie. people's care people's growth um, is through their deeds and their actions more than like just the way that. Alan Grant's body language evolves in relation to the two kids alone as a statement of arc versus like, let's talk about it or let me exposit my feelings. It, it, so, yeah. But that's by the great... same token, a single line of dialogue does the most to reveal who, um, uh, what's his name? The, the, oh my gosh, the uh, planet Earth. Um, Hammond. Dr. Hammond is one single line of dialogue. It's, not, it's the wrong Attenborough. I was going to say, you used that yeah, 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 connection to go. Yeah, yeah. But it different Attenborough. Works, but the, got the, the job when, done. I, I, Austin, I think you pointed this out to me as well. The ice cream scene. Oh, I love that scene. Is one of the most is, revelatory in a single line of dialogue. Next time we'll do better. Yeah. Yeah. And and it's funny like, because I always heard uh, this criticism of that scene of like, oh, it's just a, it's just like a scene stuck in there to be a commercial for all their merchandise. And I was like, that's the, it's the tragedy the entire, of everything that he yeah. that slipped out of his fingers. Like that's the point. He's and trying the fact to that make that, it, that, son, that creation of the commercial product is the thing that continuously trips him up. It's yeah, it's it's. I think I think screenwriters and can often fall into the trap of thinking that wordiness equals content and there's the trite thing the show right. show don't tell thing and and that'll only get you so far but like i think what's interesting with games and with action movies in particular is you go one step further than show don't tell you go like act don't show you know like like it's there is a very direct and specific it's why i genuinely always point people towards like action movies fucking children's cartoons <laughs> like uh video games like stuff where there is a brevity because there has to be for various reasons we can learn so much from i want the AAA writer on the podcast to give her her opinions on this because I think your stuff probably there's so much stuff that I wish that I could talk about that I keep going through my head and being like can I say that can you talk in general terms can you break off a little and talk about this a bit I'm interested yeah and I, have, I have to I have to say I have I have five minutes that's just, a shame just, I wanted to give you a heads up R. I. P. it is a shame well I wanted to ask the question Austin of is there is the suggestion uh, that dodge. <laughs> Very good dodge. Solid is this, dodge. There. Is the suggestion Solid. that the existence of side quests uh, e equals inherently bad writing? Is that what the suggestion is? That if you can go and do stuff that is not related to a main quest, that that is bad writing? Because I would not agree with that at all. That that's is I that think. what the, I, the I, article I think, is asserting? I I think what he. I'm not. I'm. I'm very much extrapolating. So I'm just kind of tr inventing a character at this point and trying to use them as a mouthpiece for dissent. Is this Twitter? I don't understand. Uh, <laughs> he. Because um, uh, what I think. I what I think is a fair summary is that um, content of any kind is like sufficient. We have to make it longer. So the, like we have to have a minimum 40 hours of gameplay. So let's throw a bunch of superfluous content in there um, that just adds to the runtime, you know? Whereas film, 
by virtue of its medium, it tends to have the opposite mandate. Like, how can we shave five minutes out of this cut? How can we shave 10 minutes out of this cut? So it's often a winnowing down to the most diamond grade material, whereas hmm. at least in the old fashioned cliche AAA model, it was the opposite. We, let's pad this, this is too short. Um, obviously things so, are changing. I mean, that I can say uh, is definitely not true in my experience. <clears throat> I was told really what? early, this game will end up being way longer than you think. <laughs> that that That's a common thing that in yep. AAA writing, they're like, we think it's going to be this, double whatever we think it's going to be. On the indie side too, like we we always set out to make a two or three hour game knowing full well that because we're trying for two or three, we'll hit like six, seven. Yeah. Like Why is also, that? There's, there's also evolution of like longer doesn't automatically equal better today the way uh, a cynical executive at a publisher might have said so 10 years also, ago. Also, like, I've think... definitely seen movies with padding. Oh, oh, sure. Sure. Have you ever seen anime? <laughs> Come on. So why? But hold on. I'm curious. Why is it that the you can double the time? What 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 ends up happening? Is it that you can't string the two things together as easily as you thought? Or, no, or what it's is just it? that everything that you're you're having conversations about or that you're writing ends up taking longer than you expect it to. Like there's no there's no logic behind that other than people being wrong in their estimations. It's just that you'll, there's no like, oh, we couldn't string these two things together. We need to add more stuff in. It is just the stuff we have is longer than we thought it would be when you actually put it into the video game. Interesting. Probably pacing. Just you have to, you can't just throw dialogue at players. It has to be slowed down. But well, like things like so side players... quests are concerned. I don't think any of it uh, on any of the games that I've even consulted on has been padding. It's all been someone had a really cool idea and they were like, oh, we should totally put that in. That's mm -hmm. neat. And they really wanted to have the side quest in. None of it's ever been, we need more side quests. They're all just cool ideas that people Ideally, wanted. yeah. I mean, I, I've it, seen it, how like you create one system and then in order for that system to feel like it's robust enough to warrant being a system, now you have that system now exists in all five of your different locations within the game. And then, well, shit, now we, we ended up making a, a scalable system now. So you get level one, two, and three of that system, but that's now scales exponentially across all five of those regions. And so there's 15, but then you also have to, so I can see how all of a sudden this one was like, wouldn't it be great if we just had this one little thing, how it becomes a system and that system becomes, and I can imagine the frustration when it is, this is a, this is just an idea that we had. It'd be kind of cool. It, it, it's going to be a great feature. And that feature becomes a system. And that system becomes a drain on the resources, whether it be time, money, or people. And then, next thing you know, the full life cycle of that thing is it gets cut. Yeah. That's got to be If you want to pitch something that has four legs, let me tell you, be prepared for it to be cut. <laughs> <laughs> Look how long it took for dogs to actually Literally become a mechanic the in a game. Literally the conversation. <laughs> Hold on. Someone. On that note, I got to bail. I Good love day, you all sir. very dearly. I Players. love this conversation. Um, Alon, are you coming back or are you staying there? What's happening? No, I'm coming back. I'll be okay, there. Cool. I just don't know exactly when yet. Okay. Figure it out. Do not at Greg Miller. Don't do it. And ask him if he loves dogs. Hashtag PWR. Don't do it. Bye, guys. I have to leave only a minute behind him. So should we just um, leave then? Uh, but, uh, well, no, I just wanted to kind of poke at this uh, 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 one second longer just because... I mean, look, I've, I, I've written on, you know, games full-time for nine months now, and I've written a number of screenplays, um, and I feel like games are a much bigger challenge in a way that I would think a lot of <laughs> screenplay writers probably don't understand because there are all these challenges of like, well, the player sure. can't know this or, well, if we give the player that thing, then we can't take it away because then they'll be annoyed at a certain point in time. Like there are so oh, many yeah. things that you have to think about in terms of, but the player that you never have to think about in terms of a screenplay. And it, I feel like that, the, even, even the action thing, like there are so many movies now and I feel like I'm seeing it more and more often where dialogue is delivered with no action whatsoever, where it's just people speaking in a room to each other. And I really appreciate things like Westwood, uh, where most of their monologues are action driven. Like um, Al Swearingen is getting a blowjob during one of his first monologues and it's like, sure, he's still sitting on a bed, but it is physical action. He's having a physical response while giving a monologue where a lot of movies just have someone standing in a room. 
You can't do that in a video game either. You cannot just have someone deliver a monologue to a camera. It's so much harder because you have to be like, how do you make the player feel like they have some participation in this? I don't even know if you can really have successful monologues in video games now that I think of it. I would never pitch one. That would well, be a hard thing to do. Let me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you've literally delivered one in, in our game, but that's okay. But the, I feel like that's not long enough to be a monologue. It's not, no, yeah, we've not, no. You, you definitely risk the player's interest for sure. But then you could also make compelling arguments that like a lot of first person shooters are monologues because you're basically playing one character's perspective 30 minutes at a time yeah. you know and yeah i think with with no one else kind of interrupting i think i think we get too hung up in stories being about words on a page and i think that's where a lot of problems or false comparisons come from like writing is so much more than just the the wordy bit it's I also the words it's that you usually... don't even put on the page the amount of stuff that mm -hmm. But like even I wrote this fantasy novel when I was a kid that I've lost and I'm devastated that I lost it. Like I had this full three books when I was, I don't know, 12 oh, maybe. I wish I could awesome. read them now. I feel like I'd be like, wow, this is atrocious, but I love it. Uh, and it was about these kids who when they would dream could change reality. Uh, but they mm. were all like knights and stuff in their dreams. Um, but anyway, <laughs> I don't remember what, what I did with it. Uh, that going through doing that stuff the amount of shit that i had that was in paper that i had never put into the book just to make sure i understood it like when was this mm -hmm. season what kind of bird lived here what would they eat at this period in time like what does this look like what kind of clothes do you need to survive in the cold like all of this stuff that you don't even write down that you have to know to be able to get through something like a novel or a video game especially if there's like any kind of intense plot you have to have so many words that you can't ever write that you'd be like well why are we spending time even thinking about this thing but if it doesn't make sense in your head there's going to be a bunch of plot holes when you put it to someone else it can be very complicated screenplays it's not like they're easy i'm not saying that i've definitely always just found them easier than anything else it's you definitely have more set. you i think you have more predictable fences around your your sandbox uh in a screenplay you know for a, especially a feature film as opposed to like a series yeah i i think that i think it there the challenge becomes the, comparable to you know writing a great poem or something where it's like okay how bre how brief how can i avoid the fat can i you know like it's amazing to me how sometimes films can you know f be 90 minutes and feel agonizingly long but then there's other film just because they just aren't saying anything of substance, you know, like not a pacing thing, but they just feel like, my God, you didn't have the, the material to warrant this. And then there's others that are two and a half hours that fly by because they hold your interest so effectively. I, How I, great um, is it, though, that games like as well work as a backbone for the, I'm fascinated by the, the this the all the D&D like podcasts and YouTube shows that exist now where people just use a game rule set and basically create like sitcoms or or fantasy novels or like stories from that framework mm -hmm. and just to, to look at to look at video games and not see all of the enormous potential and the fact that we are still essentially in our like silent movie era we're still figuring out the core rule set of making games mm -hmm. that's just like i can't think of anywhere more interesting to be a, as a writer than than fiddling with this stuff it's great no it's also certainly how i feel about music as well like the interactive component of of writing a video game score is overwhelmingly the the pull i love scoring films and i, st I still do it in tv and all that sort of stuff but games definitely keep me up at night in a way that I, I don't think anything else could for that reason. Like the idea of engaging the player as a co-author. But that's why I thought like, does that expose, like, do I, do I inadvertently become complacent because I think, oh, the player is going to love that they caused this. And therefore, if it's not the greatest melody ever, or if it's not the greatest dialogue ever, they won't notice because of the satisfaction of having caused it. That's why I, I was just and trying visuals, to really... And do visuals make movies lazy that they I've don't have to... I've never had do, that thought, you know. Austin. Have you had that thought when making music? The player's going to love it no matter what. I think that all the time when I DJ. I'm like, they're drunk. I could swap between <laughs> these two songs that have different keys. I, no one's going to fucking ever care. Th I don't know that I've ever thought that way about music, but I have had a few instances where I went back. I mean, perfect thing playing through Mass Effect uh, Legendary Edition, you know, like in my memory, 
It's just bulletproof. Everything about Mass Effect is perfect. Yeah. And the then best you go game back developer and, in the world is your memory. Like, you know, well, for sure. And, it, and, you know? <laughs> and I remember going back and and um, and I've got this whole sort of thesis on what I think the like canon romance options are of like this is just the perfect way to do it. Um, and but begrudgingly, what that meant was um, that uh, I always chose as femship. Caden, who I otherwise find to be the most bland and ridiculously stupid character. And that's where I was like, um, and, and when you play his romance is so awkwardly written because it's like, if you open the door, he's instantly like, so, and he just like, he goes from zero to a hundred instantly. And, and I was watching my, uh, it's a lot of blokes like that, to be fair, though. <laughs> well, that's yeah, my true. point. That's the point. People, <laughs> people, because people are leaning in, they don't, it's easy to give it a pass. And that's that. That's only the, again, I'm not, I'm sitting here trying to steel man the criticism. So I'm, not, yeah. I'm not here actually leveling. Well, I, don't uh, well, I don't think that's a problem. Written. I think, no, it, that, to me, that's knowing the medium. I think um, James Cameron's a brilliant example of this. Like James Cameron, lots of valid criticisms of his work, but like, you know, pretty solid filmmaker who makes stuff that people like. He's very. He's very, literally never made a bad film, has he? I don't think. I don't. Not my. Not my opinion. No, and definitely very rarely made unsuccessful. I think Abyss was the only one that didn't like absolutely blow the doors off financially, right? It's still considered a classic. But like, it's still a classic. Still a great film. Um, but my point is, like, he, despite all that, he still definitely knows when to show off, when to like do something visually like over here, very big and actiony, and or when to use like a gimmick like three D, or when to use like a cool visual effect to kind of... He still of, knows when to take advantage of the media. He knows when to throw glitter at the camera, right? He knows when, and 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 I'm sure part of his thought process with that, and and, and this is definitely, I'll, I'll admit this with game design, like, when you, you put those flourishes in the moments that you know are weakest on other fronts. But how does that relate to, like, this specific example of a really whiplashy romance arc in well, I'm, 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 well, I'm, I'm going back to your original. Point, yeah, Mike, bring it of, to the point we were just Jesus, discussing. I was talking about How the dare one you not be directly this is a very related? I was, topic I was, podcast, and I, I demand was, yeah, exactly. Con- Let's stay focused, people. Um, no, I was going back to the thing. You're, you, the thing you were saying, which was basically like you theoretically could, as a composer, go. Well, this is technically impressive. or this is reactive, and therefore I don't necessarily have to do the best work on every other column. I would argue, actually, that's part of it. I, I mentioned the other day, like, asset revelation schedules. So the idea of, like, when you're planning the development of a video game, you go, okay, I've got this much art. I'm going to pace it so you see new stuff at a regular pace. Another thing we do, uh, and I've always done in our games, is we'll then plot other areas of interest. So, like, when are we adding a new mechanic? When's a new character showing up? When there, When's there's a joke that we know is really funny? When have we got some new music playing? And we'll stagger those things so that we know, like... Okay, the gameplay in this bit's a little bit stagnant for about half an hour, so we better make sure there's like a really cool visual moment, or there's a this or something else that's kind of. I think it's absolutely that's okay to work around weaknesses. Yeah, one hundred percent, we do that. Like you always, so the player that's, is getting something cool every five minutes, or am I reacting to something that you didn't say, Austin, or that isn't what the point? Yeah, you're I making? do think that that I do think that that is in a sense the just kind of the that's the artistry of, of the work yeah yeah for yeah sure. like that's that's you called it craft I, I called it art because i'm a pretentious indie but still <laughs> like yeah no it's absolutely that well but it's it's it, but there, it's fundamentally the same like there because we do things i you know i have a little phrase i use in my writing all the time of covering the seams it's the exact same thing you're yeah. talking about if i have to get from a to c i have to devise a b that helps me mask the what would otherwise awkwardly be a mm-hmm. Just smashing together, like especially if we're, it's a video game, like an open Austin. world. You just crossfade. Just crossfade. Exactly. Give, every, give everyone a drink is a lot of approach. Yeah, just it's everyone's approach. drunk and then they don't know if the transition's wrong. <laughs> yeah. Yep. That that's true. All my music should come with Crossfades. alcohol recommendations. Um, Austin, I did always. Yeah, it, I, I thought about this a number of times since you said it. Uh, the idea of picking between Ashley and Caden, and I have always made sure that Ashley died. Um, and she is a space racist. Well, she's the racist. I stand yeah, by she's it. She's the racist. However, yeah, for sure. she is I don't think more that's a death interesting. Oh, <laughs> he is sure. on Alana's playthrough. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. She can die. I mean, she killed my Rex, and I was very upset about it. But she is more interesting as a character. And it's, and it's a funny thing to think about where when you have the control over which character you get to kill, 
and you are actively mm-hmm. choosing to kill the one who inspires emotion and let the blank slate one live. I, I've never saved her, so I don't even know if I'm selling myself short because I hate her so much that I'm like, she must die, therefore that's satisfying to me. But then in her death, am I not letting her have an arc where she stops being a space racist? <laughs> Which would be oh, much I, more see, interesting I, to watch than Kate. I like her I like her arc very much. Uh, never uh, seen it. And, <laughs> yeah, I I, I, I think she's one of she's one of my favorite characters because she's also she's also a genuine badass. Um, and to me, the 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 way that especially the fact that she hates Shepard in the second game, which I assume Caden does also, um, you know, they're 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 written very similarly. But I've never never had Caden not die hmm. initially when I played through. I just was he was the only expendable character because I found him boring. He is boring. Um, and um, but that on like on my first, you know, male shepherd. And then uh, but then I, I started to develop this. I like I love the idea. My my canon uh, shepherd idea is that like um, she loses she loses everyone she cares about. And it's the it's the motivator. It's the motivator of realizing like like I need to be the final link in that chain, basically, like by giving myself over to the final, the the grand finale, and, and essentially self sacrificing. Um, I I'm a, I'm following in the footsteps of those that I love. So I was like, I love the idea that in the first one, um, she romances Caden specifically because I plan on killing him, and so she has to carry this grief, which then tees up, up Thane, tees up Thane in the second one, someone who she knows in advance is dying, and because I really actually like the. If you romance Thane in two, the dynamic with him in three is quite is quite poignant, and I and I love that that's the romance plot of the third game is visiting him in the hospital and then realizing, you know, once he's gone, um, I I the mission is all that drives me now, uh, and I've, to me that that arc is so much more effective on the idea that she she keeps losing the people that that um, she, she can't she can't have that. That's not her purpose, um, and but What's it's funny cool because is you didn't have to write all that. Like you definitely put the pieces together and built that, and that's cool, and that shows your basically your exactly intuition. what I was just about to say. Oh, sorry. No, no, no. It's, no. Run what away. artistry? What artistry <laughs> that the team created a framework for you? Like I promise you, there's more for you to enjoy there than there is in oh. <laughs> the Chris Pratt vehicle. Uh, tomorrow, oh, absolutely! Sure. No, that's the thing. That, but that's where I go. That's where I go. I've gotten huge. Plus, I also have done a full like Garrus, you know, in every in every game, and that to me he's was the always special like, boy. He's he's the hero. I love I love him. To he is death, a bit of I, a space cop. Oh yeah, he's know, very he's, corrupt. He's all right. uh, yeah, I, 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 I love, but I, to me, Garrus as my best friend is became my favorite uh, mm. because uh, the 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 bridge scene in the third one as a romance is really great. But and something also, about he doesn't have lips. What would it be like to kiss him? I think about this a lot. You've I don't before, literally. Yeah. I never think it would be like that. kissing a crab. His face is like a hard shell. Well, like a strong got, heroic his face crab, is all like a crab up who too, could look you know? after like, you, like, like a, crab a sexy that's got crab. But I still yeah, don't know like, if I want to spoon it. You know, like I just. Mm. Well, he's got that hard. natural curve, though. So that you know, true. It would, it would be more... yeah, I have no, I have no. Yeah, that's all canon. <laughs> it's uh, all canon. Yeah, so I, 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 I. This is where they created a toolkit. They created such a sprawling toolkit that I was able to put it together in a way that even when I think about it, it affects me. Like I just love, I just love Mass Effect so goddamn much. But when you get down into the nitty gritty of like, how is most of this dialogue written? How is like most of this plotting done? It's like, it's pretty like, it's, you know, comparable to a, uh, and this is not true of all because there's some really wonderful moments, but it's comparable to like, you know, the most generic TV procedural where they're like, okay, look, let's just get to the meat and potatoes because we got a lot we got to get through. Um, and like that Caden story is a perfect example of they're like, we're just going to cut to the chase of it being a romance. So like any sense of it blossoming, there's no time for that. Mm-hmm. Even though we have a fucking 40 hour game. Uh, and so he just pretty much goes to like commander. You want to, you want to meet me in I the think back. You and it's like how many men do that Austin <laughs> 
Well, that's not a defense. That's no it's defense. Pretty accurate, uh, though. But okay, fine. But it makes for a very unbelievable Kane is romance. that guy. Yeah. Well, it's one in every it's, social group. <laughs> it's hard to imagine getting away with that to a commanding officer in a military it situation. And but, yet uh, they still do it, though, don't yeah, they? Well, it's a look, I don't doubt that. Situation. I don't doubt that most guys. Most. Many or most are that brazen and ridiculous, and that maybe that he is conscientiously written to be a realistic estimation of that. But to (laughs) then also be a realistic romance off of that means that that has to be something that you respond to, which there are going to be women who are going to respond to that level of brazenness, sure. But to me, it felt like. You're right that romance subplots are often pretty rushed. Like, I had a. uh, Is it the new. I think it's the new Colossus. I don't remember which Wolfenstein it is. It might be the first one. Um, where I think it's the first you're talking BJ about. BJ and his nurse at that yes. point in time. You know, she's saving someone and, and cleaning him and giving him baths and cleaning up his shit at, for years. And then... The classic love story. Dating. And I was... I was no, 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 Weirdly, no, no. that did Never. happen a lot. That's happened a lot in World Wars, interestingly. That is a... Really? That is definite, yeah, 100%. I was, I was There's like, why I had to of, clean up somebody's shit for years? I don't think that we could get past that. A lot of, like, a lot of, like, soldiers like coming off the front that lines. Order. That's probably where it came marrying from. Marrying nurses. Yeah, it's, it's, I, think it, I think it's actually a weird... I agree with well, you. It okay, doesn't, but couldn't doesn't strike me as a romantic speak? situation. If I remember correctly, he, he wasn't speaking the whole time as well. I mean, so it's not like they I mean, bonded. given what, what that character comes out of that character's mouth when he can speak, it's probably a... a Carolan. Probably a better situation. That's all he says is Carolan. Let it's amazing he can speak Swoon. after the events. It's amazing he can speak after the events of the second game. I that's love quite BJ. I'm a big I fan. love BJ. I love the. I love. I love those games. The the oh, that second game is fantastic. They're, they're fantastic. They're they really, very, really good. They thoroughly. Yeah, those. I did not expect them to be anywhere near as good as they were. Um, they're so good. And Austin, to your point about, um, I wanted to say this when you were talking I, about it about Mass Effect being, you know, the way you play it and creating your own canon. That is where I see the future of video game storytelling going. Right now, I think that in a lot of cases, we are making interactive films. It sub very explicitly of that. And I think that... Like Ratchet and Clank. Have you have you played... Like, that's, it. to me, it's fucking amazing. But it is also... It is that. It, mm-hmm. is, it is like, here's story point A, B, C, D, and we're going to dazzle the shit out of you along the way. Yeah. And they do that. Yeah, and a lot of them, a lot of games do. I think that... When speaking of that, we are currently not taking advantage of the potential of the medium because we don't know how to yet. Like, it, ha- it hasn't anymore. gotten there yet. But I absolutely see sure. a future where, like, I'm very interested in Dying Light 2 because of some of the stuff they're doing with this. You know, Ken Levine has spoken about it. Um, where we will be having experiences that don't have those set pieces that you can't rely on. Oh, this part's not as good, so let's put the songbird in here. That'll be a cool moment. Where we can't do that anymore because every interaction every story beat is tailored to whatever the player has done previously not in a telltale way not in a way that's like you know your 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 explosion was a different color in in a way that because of the software that we actually have at our disposal that things will actually play out completely different for completely different people and i think that the limits on that that we just don't know them yet how do you invent something i'm so haven't seen it yet i'm so excited to see because if anyone if anyone's going to make those breakthroughs, it's exactly the people who are currently working on those things, and I'm I'm excited to see. It. I I am very excited to be like the second person over that hill. Like I'm not going to yeah. be the, I'm not going to be the guy who you does said it, it first time and time again. Like where where as soon as somebody can do it, it's easier for everyone else to do it. And like I've seen Ken's game. game. Yeah. He's he's working on this kind of thing, mm-hmm. and sure. I I saw it four years ago. <laughs> like I I and, and I don't that's know the if thing, can right? Do you it. need. You need the investment, and that's the other thing that's really interesting. And yeah, he will need however many years, at least four, as you said, like already, and, and many more to kind of work it out. And then there'll be a two-hour GDC talk yeah. where they go over it, and the, the 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 smarter kind of critics and analysis that will happen in the game's uh, press will happen, and then we'll all rip it off, and it'll take us half a year to add that feature to our game. And that's the games industry, and that's how we've created such exponentially... Better games. It's all over industries, time. for the record. That's for like sure. Literally, for sure. That's like just how innovation works in the human. I think system. one thing we got very right at the start, which is different to other industries, is the games industry has always been aggressively anti, uh, you know, 
patents, trademarking, like, the, sorry, not trademarking, the, the copywriting of mechanics, like, the games industry has always resisted. God, There's it'd be so obviously bad. standout examples of that wrong. There's obvious examples where it, where things have been locked in in that way, but like on the whole, I would say better than a lot of industries. We we've understood where we are, and I think we've also had the lessons of things like the film industry's history. If you look how long the film industry took to get to where it is now, and how how long that was, and how much that process was slowed down by corporate interest, essentially. Yeah. We, if you look at something like the like history, like what? Of, can you name an example? Because I, I can't think. I'm I mean, not there sure were that that's there true. were like five proprietary projection technologies and cinemas. If you look at the format wars, I'm not saying we're we're beyond all of that with games, but like, if you look at like what's the what what is the ratio of a film screen took forty years to standardize, fifty years to standardize. That kind of thing is what I'm talking about. And partially that is corporate stuff. Partially that is rival companies who had different screen technologies and would muscle other companies out of town. You've obviously got the studio system as it once existed before the breakup of the monopoly. You've got a lot of very... I, I'm not putting it all on the shoulders of capitalism. I know that's my trademark, but, I, but there are <laughs> this. There, their film industry but took... Everything you just said is a description of competitive businesses. Like and I'm saying that games are competitive but they've also been very good at not being overly competitive if you look at like the amount of information sharing say that happens at something like gdc where i can literally go and watch a talk like like a good example of this is i'm trying really hard there's a thing that happened in a video in a triple a game about two or three years ago that we're ripping off basically that we want in our game i can go and watch a talk from the person who invented that thing for two hours and they will explain in absolute detail how that was put together how they cross every technical uh border all the mistakes they made i could go and get that information and that level of of sharing is something that modern industries specifically tech and games industries have been very good at allowing space for the idea that somewhat the the, you wouldn't get the, the 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 guy who invented betamax going on stage and explaining and sharing all of the information about how that process went and all of their business problems and successes with that to a crowd the games industry very early on realized the only way for us to innovate at the pace we had to to be the next in my opinion the next art form required amount of amount of information sharing that is I'd say unprecedented. I think that's that's a big statement, but I think especially if you compare it to other previous media's and pop cultures, sure. where I, it's an interesting. It's an interesting. It took us less time than forty-five years to standardize the screen ratio, so I'm going to use that as an. As but my, we're also building off of like you, that's 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 you, that's a little bit apples and oranges because the games industry is springing forward from where it was birthed technologically relative to all that came before. Where, okay, something film, else like polygon rendering. Once one games, once one, once like you had the first wave of polygon kind of uh, rendering that was happening in like the demo scene, that to it happening in a commercial product to happening in every commercial product was very quick, very quick compared to most. Sure. Like that's you know we we share we 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 boast we show off we go on the GDC stage and say look how clever this is let me boringly explain it to you for an hour. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's also broader trends. I think information sharing in general has gotten a lot easier since the age of the internet. That's a good example of something that we didn't invent. That's not the games industry. So you're not... I, don't, I think I'm making us... Maybe I'm overstating my case, but I think there's definitely something interesting to the way games culture has evolved. I'm, I'm trying to see if I can find the answer uh, very quickly here to what might be an interesting corollary is there is exactly one film, The Jazz Singer, that was uh, famously the first ever sound mm-hmm. film, which, and I was trying to look up because uh, something I, I realized I didn't remember uh, is which studio produced that. Because if if you're if what you're saying holds true, then one studio theoretically would have held on to sound as its proprietary thing for as long as humanly possible, and they did. And that, well, that's what I'm trying to find yeah, out. Yeah, like if you look at that, that period in history, I, my understanding is there were there were a couple of different proprietary methodologies for doing sound. And if you actually look for the widespread adoption of when, basically when movies moved over to sound as like the standard for film, I think it was like a decade. Like I, I'm pulling that number out of my ass, but I think that's right. I think basically it's been a while since I've read that book, but like it was a while. Like the the technology was not. It wasn't that you went out to see to the movies like a year later and everything was sound. 
but there's a lot of hundred. there's there's a lot of factors for that. You know, not every production right. company is going to be equipped to produce with sound straight out of the gate. Theaters, obviously, weirdly enough, do you know which movie theater in the world was the first ever to exhibit the jazz singer and I therefore don't. the first to? It's the most random thing. I, I sat in that theater. They would have been the first a couple to of years ago. Speakers. They were the first to huh. ever be able to sync to to play back synchronized mm -hmm. huh. like phonographs existed like so speakers to the extent that you want to label them sure. that um, existed but the idea of the projecting sync. a synchronized sound yeah. um, the first movie theater equipped to do that is the it's called it's in what's called the casino which is the large round column shaped building on the edge of Catalina Island off the coast of of Los Angeles. No way. Hmm. It's that's the kind, most of the bizarre kind of thing that I'm talking about is like video games still have to have those moments. We still have to have our first synchronized audio to video moment. There, there are still so many things that we haven't done. And, and to Mike's point, I feel Absolutely. like doesn't the way that engines function, doesn't that directly pertain to how much sharing is going on? So like, say if you work on Unreal and Unreal mm. is, is used by however many devs and Epic is offering support to each of them. And it's like, well, we know this because of the way this game was made. So let's give you this advice and this support because we've learned that from this one. Like because of the amount of mm -hmm. tech that's shared or is used even oh, in AAA. Oh, you're right, 100%. That's definitely true now. What's really, and, and, and engines definitely speed it up. But the way we got there was through information sharing. Like that's that true. there was, if you go back, I guess now, God, I'm getting old, like 15, 20 years when everyone had their own proprietary engine, they were still massively oversharing. I remember being in the room um, when we added, oh, not me, much cleverer people than me, added a bunch of features that they'd seen in Gears of War. I remember that one. We were working on another game that wasn't in Unreal Engine. Gears of War had come out. We were in a proprietary kind of in-house engine. And literally, GDC had happened, and our engineers had come back from GDC and were like, right, we've got to get... Gears, the, Gears was, of War is the reason that GTA has a cover system. Like, it's so direct. Yeah, and but but also just, like, visually, like, there was... I, I, I can't off the top of my head, there was, like, a couple of, like, aesthetic gimmicks in the Unreal Engine added They made everything game. green. They, had, they made everything green. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I remember the guys came back and they had, like, a five-page like note five pages of, of notebooks like explaining how to make it that exact shade of green or whatever yeah. it was right like and that's and and so i think you're right i think engines definitely have led to a degree of standardization but for example the thing i alluded to earlier where i'm stealing something from a triple a game they're not in unity true that's just that's because and this is something that really matters is methodology is actually the the massive differentiator like if you're looking the engines themselves realistically i'd say unreal has just added a bunch of stuff that's pushed them a little bit further ahead but generally the engines are about much of a muchness in terms of like their performance and what you can achieve with them it's really about the process and how you make things and the, the methodologies that you apply you can take a technique from i could look at an unreal tutorial and often do to see how you would do something in unreal and you change a couple of words and you trim around something that's a strength or a weakness of your particular engine dependent on whatever and you you carry it through technology matters much less than the skills and the clever solutions that humans invented with those tools and that's yeah, the for sure. that's the sh that's the that's the shit that travels that's the stuff and the games industry um, will continue to move together you know like there's and so we much will, further and and Ken will do his thing and it'll be fantastic and groundbreaking and it'll win all the awards. And like I said, then then a couple of years later we'll all work out how to do it. Unless he uh trademarks it like the Nemesis system, in which case it'll never be anything. I don't whatsoever. see Ken Well, yeah. Right not trademarks, yeah, right? That was patented, patented, not trademarked. Yeah. For yeah. the uh for the record, I, I am a huge believer in what you're saying, and God knows that I've given a million GDC talks about how to budget orchestral recording mm -hmm. sessions, how to work with musicians, like just trying to share literally everything that I've done because my attitude has always been, look, I'm a composer. I I try to earn a living. And to some degree, that means having something proprietary that makes me worth hiring versus somebody else. But I am also a gamer and mm -hmm. I want games to benefit. I want to play better games tomorrow than I did yesterday. And if my knowledge might move that by 0.1% because some composer heard just the right thing mm -hmm. and went and wrote the best score ever, the gamer, the composer in me has a huge professional admiration, but the gamer in me just straight up 
up wants to play better games. So, yeah. for the record, I am I am I'm pushing against this to find the the the, uh, the um, I'm I'm exploring this as I like to. Um, but I certainly agree that I, that is a strength of the game industry, and I have long well, said, as someone who does a lot of movies, well, let me just finish my sentence yeah. and then I'll shut up. I, I will say, as someone who has walked in the film community a lot and the video game community, there is no film equivalent to GDC and things like that, and I fully acknowledge that. I do think you are perhaps overstating, I feel like you're kind of overstating the power of that sharing and also understating the stagnation that might come from trying to keep things proprietary. Um, because okay. I think certain things are just can't be kept on. And some forever. things are kept proprietary, okay. right? Some things, one hundred percent, there are things I couldn't go and make Unreal Engine tomorrow, even if I had a hundred million dollars. Because nor is can you I just make. go make John Wick without permission. Like so, people sure. protect their IP, and so anyway, I just wanted to say I, I think there's a lot of nuance to this that I don't want to just go charging past. But I promised you, Alana, I would shut up and now. I'm Does going. film not need GDC? Like. You can still get access to a lot of here's how this was made via interviews or via director's commentary, but because we kind of understand the mechanics of filmmaking, is it just that the film industry doesn't need a GDC to be like, here's how we did this thing? Because it, it, everyone is experienced enough that generally we have I've a knowledge about... of how most things are made. I've never actually thought of it like that. That's an interesting thought. Uh, my knee-jerk reaction tells me um, that there would be no downside to if there was a conference that I could go to that was all film, not a fan event, but it's like GDC. It's all directors, writers, composers, editors, sound designers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, casting directors, all. And like over here, Steven Spielberg is explaining how they approach the choreography in the new West Side Story that he did. Uh, but right down the hall, ro uh, Roger Deakins is giving a talk about lenses or- I would also definitely like go. I would 100% <laughs> yeah. see that. But like, I think that's, that, that would be massive. Because GDC is that. GDC, it, GDC is like, you'll go into a room and Neil Druckmann is in that room. And then the next room is Mike Bithell. And then the next but room how is- frequently In a smaller room, in a smaller room is Mike Bithell. In a different hall. <laughs> The shed, yeah, like the shed outside. The yeah, that's the thing. The making of making of documentaries as well are bollocks, and I think that's the thing that that you realise when you have got something like GDC. even interviews. Interviews are bollocks. They're all about marketing spin. Them, I, and I say this as someone who watched every making of thing I could find about John Wick before working on it. I learned more in the tw first twenty minutes sat down with Chad, the director, than I could have in any of that stuff because. Just going to him and going, okay, so genuinely, like, how do you put this shit together? Like, and that's the stuff that you would get in a GDC equivalent is that kind of, uh, you know, the the one I always use an example is um, volume. Just absolutely stole um, Insomniac's core character movement process. I literally sat there with the GDC talk going uh, on a loop because it took more than an hour to make and coded that kind of collider and player navigation system. And it meant the volume felt like a triple a game in terms of just the fluidity of its movement and the reactiveness that's ridiculous that is utterly ridiculous that is that person on stage doing that hour-long talk gave me so much value they could have charged me like a consultancy fee of yeah. tens of thousands of dollars for that content and they didn't they just did it for like a free pass and then I had to pay GDC organizers to go and see the talk. It's it's and how it's often mind blowing does something happen in a film that other filmmakers won't go? Oh, I know how they did that. Whereas that's a fair the question. Games, maybe you, I don't know how any of it's done. Like even the things that you think you understand, you definitely don't understand the way other studios do it. I think it, technically so you're different. right on the tools. I think I'm pro. I, I imagine a good film director absolutely knows how they would shoot something. Well, they have seen a friend the they can ask. Be like, how do we that? No, that's how they did that. But I think you lose the thought process, and I think that's and maybe and maybe that's something that films have moved beyond. But like I said, in games at the moment, it is still so much constrained and defined by the clever solutions people come up with yeah. and the thought process that leads through it. I want to. S I, like I'm sure anyone could look at John Wick. We actually we got a, a friend of mine who's a storyboarder to and do analysis on John Wick and like work out okay how long does he hold a shot for how how does his action scenes work whatever. But again, like 
it's not the same as listening to the guy talk about what he was going for or how he approached it. And I think I, you can see like the, um, these, not to the, mention how many solutions came about. Cause while they were shooting, somebody said, what if we did this instead of that? Spontaneously or no one in the knew, moment. right? No one intended like, and I've had that conversation. I won't uh, with filmmakers, like talking to people. I've been lucky enough to talk to a few different filmmakers over the years. And I've gone up to them and I've said like, well, where'd you get that idea? And yeah, it's just, well, we had to film it and we had to choose, there was camera wouldn't fit in that corner. So we had to do it there. Yeah. It's like, but that's that's so powerful and so valuable that knowledge and and maybe that exists informally in among filmmakers but in sure. that case it's less accessible to you know new talent or you know independent people or whatever i get to i get the same level of access to all of that triple a knowledge as a triple a person attending that conference that's really cool that's there's still barriers to, to entry GDC. to gdc oh it's super difficult it's cool to i wish up. i wish I wish there was less barriers to entry for kind of indie folks because yeah. the, the costs are high. But the um, but yeah, it's it that knowledge sharing is yeah. I'm very sorry, very stubbornly proud of 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 that. I think that's a cool yeah, thing in the industry. Video game industry is cool, and the thing that like mm. keeps me in it is being extremely excited to see where it goes because I feel like there's just so much potential that's currently untapped. So many things that we will be able to do as hardware progresses that we currently can't do. That's just super exciting. Shout out to video games. It's, it's true. Shout that, out yeah, to the I sun mean, going down here. I've just realized I'm sat in absolute darkness. Yeah, and Austin, didn't yeah. you have to go 20 minutes ago? I, I, yeah, I did, but I, it's my <laughs> own fault because I kind of opened up this can of worms and then I, I, I really wanted to hear these thoughts, so I do have to run. <laughs> all right. Um, well, um, but, uh, thank you. We will see you all next week. Hooray. That was fun.